I'm Alex Mozet, and welcome to Winner Take All, where we talk about the constant battle between large tech monopolies and traditional incumbents. And you know, I've been thinking a lot about um, that intro, right? You know, is it just large tech monopolies or is it kind of big centralized power in general, which we have come to talk so much about on the show? Is it just incumbents that are suffering at the whim of these large centralized power sources? Or is it a much broader community of incumbents, individuals, small business producers on these tech platform monopolies. And, uh, you know, I, I may actually, I may actually tweak, uh, our, our intro as we've come to really see that this show is really kind of about, uh, about the resistance and, um, helping to understand the moves that tech monopolies are making, the moves that everyone else can make to bring more parity and even keeled competition to the playing field. That's really what we're trying to accomplish on the show. I think that's why everyone is so interested is how do we help level the playing fields with these big tech power sources or just big government power sources in general? Um, What can incumbents do, but what can all of us do to help level that playing field? We had General Spaulding on the show He's a brigadier general in the army. He's on the National Security Council. This guy was growing up flying B-2 stealth bombers. This guy was amazing. Highly recommend you go check that out. But he ended on a very strong note of positivity and optimism. And that is that, you know, he feels that people are waking up. And uh, I coined the term with him. You know, this is kind of the, the great awakening. And that as everyday citizens and people around the world have seen this power grab by big tech monopolies, by large big government, the people are seeing it and they're not okay with it. And as it continues to happen more and more and more, um, we are all part of that resistance. And more and more of us are waking up, more and more of us are figuring out how in our own little way to do our part and help to level that playing field. So obviously recently there was the uh, Facebook kind of oversight board, which, you know, gave down a pseudo decision on whether or not former President Trump could remain on Facebook. And a lot of the media headlines, if you read them, will say that you know, they upheld Facebook's decision. It's actually much more nuanced than that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to uh, Trump and Facebook in, in a little bit here. But before I do, it's time for a little story time with Alex. I'm going to give you a few examples uh, of things that, you know, stick out to me, books that I reference or, or you know, uh, or analogies that I reference often on the show. Um, one being 1984, the book. One being Star Wars. So we got R2 back here. Uh, we're definitely on the, uh, the light side, not the dark side. I can tell you that much. Pretty obvious who the dark side is. And there are so many parallels between, you know, those couple things. And then you may not believe it, but we're going to circle out with Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. Yeah, that's a special. If you haven't read that one, yeah, get a get a beverage or two while you while you read through that. Oh, and of course, how could I forget Modern Monopolies? Um, there's a couple central themes here, right? Again, how what have we been seeing with this uh, big tech, you know, big government power grab? We've been talking about on the show for years now, and. What are some central mechanisms that um, we see coming to light, which are very scary? So let's start off with, you know, control and data. We we're talking about with General Spaulding about we're in an information warfare today. The way that tech monopolies and big government actually complement one another. Uh, the reason why 
you're not supportive of large Chinese tech monopolies because you have a totalitarian communist government. And, you know, I talk about this a lot on the show that when you have a large tech monopoly, which is now beholden to the totalitarian government, you are playing to the totalitarian government's whims, right? You're actually helping to advance everything that that, you know, communist dictatorship is seeking to do, and you're actually accelerating their ability to do it. What do I mean by that? So let's look at a couple, look at a couple examples here. Let's go to 1984, and then I'm going to go to Modern Monopolies, and then I'm going to go to Star Wars. So 1984, you know, is is a book of fiction, but you know, it is scary how how many components of this uh, novel um, live true in today's environment. It's a story about um, socialism, uh, totalitarianism, communism, about living in a society where um, there is no freedom of thought. Uh, you have <laughs> no control over anything that you want to do, and you must be subservient in all aspects or else. Here's a good little snippet. These people, whose origins lay in the salaried middle class and upper grades of the working class, had been shaped and brought together by the barren world of monopoly industry and centralized government. This book was published in 1949 by George Orwell. Okay. So he was talking about, you know, 35 years in the future. This is what was going to happen, 1949. And boy, did he know what he was talking about. So by the barren world of monopoly industry and centralized government. Let's jump down here. Part of the reason for this was that in the past, no government had the power to keep its citizens under constant surveillance. The invention of print, however, made it easier to manipulate public opinion, and the film and the radio carried the process further. With the development of television and the technical advance which made it possible to receive and transmit simultaneously on the same instrument, private life came to an end. In the book, they have these things called like telescreens which is a TV that can also watch you and listen to you. Hmm, what does that remind you of? Like Amazon Alexa, Facebook's thing, Google's thing. Hmm, okay. So they've got that. Orwell, 1949, uh, projecting it in 1984. Well, 2021, it's here. They can listen and see everything you're doing. Every citizen, or at least every citizen important enough to be worth watching, could be kept for 24 hours a day, under the eyes of the police and in the sound of official propaganda, with all other channels of communication closed. What does that sound like? The Great Firewall. Everything we're talking about in China, where they watch everything you do, but also in the United States, what big tech is doing to watch and listen to us at all times of the day with all these devices strewn about our, our homes and offices. And then you got big government listening in over, over the waves as well. The possibility of enforcing not only complete obedience to the will of the state, but complete uniformity of opinion on all subjects now existed for the first time. Okay. All right. Well, yikes. It doesn't sound too pleasant, but hmm, does that ring a bell? Okay, now let's jump to Modern Monopolies. This is chapter two. Um, it's more of a, you know, it's a chapter about, you know, kind of looking at the economist worldview about platform business models and how that fits into um, more kind of classical economic thinking. So Hayek versus the machine or why everything you think you know about the 20th century is wrong. Got a nice little quote here from Bond. Every now and then a trigger has to be pulled or not pulled. It's hard to know which in your pajamas. Frederick Hayek, if uh, you don't know who he is, um, he was an uh, extremely influential mid-20th century economist, and uh, his best-known book was 19, published in 1944 called The Road to Sur Serfdom, which warned of the dangers of government control of economic decision-making through central planning. Hayek was a strong proponent of free markets. I'm highlighting this bit right here. This is in a different essay, uh, not from that book, but Hayek made an alternative case for why markets are a better economic system than central planning. 
In reality, it was impossible for a centralized authority to coordinate the activities of a decentralized economy effectively. Right? Think about socialism, communism in the mid 20th century. That's when Hayek was writing this. That's when 1984 was published. The problem as Hayek identified it was precisely that we don't live in a world of perfect information. An individual couldn't collect all the information necessary to effectively coordinate an, ec an economy. Hayek explained, the knowledge of the circumstances of which we must make use never exists in concentrated or integrated form, but solely as the dispersed bits of incomplete and frequently contradictory knowledge which all the separate individuals possess. Basically, this thing is fragmented to hell. No one can make sense of what's going on in a centralized fashion because we live before the age of computers and the connected revolution, which we talk about in the book, the age of information, et cetera, et cetera. Rather than op operating under perfect information, we live in a world of highly fragmented and decentralized information. This concept is called local knowledge. Or as Hayek puts it, the knowledge of the particular circumstances of time and place. For Hayek, the implications of this insight were profound. Since a central planner, think socialist government, totalitarian government, controlling and planning everything, right? Uh, Soviet Russia in the mid-20th century. Since a central planner couldn't have knowledge of the particular circumstances at a given time and place, the central planner will have to find some, uh, some way or other in which the decisions depending on them can be left to the man on the spot. Additionally, even if one person could know all of the necessary information to coordinate an economy, he wouldn't be able to possess all of it, process all of it to direct an economy because circumstances constantly change. In essence, what was needed was some form of decentralization so that local knowledge could be promptly used in economic activity. Hmm, interesting. Back to our James Bond reference. This philosophy is shared by super spy James Bond. In the film Skyfall, when Bond first meets Q, Bond's technology guru, you guys know who Q is, Q jokes that he could do more damage on my laptop sitting in my pajama, pajamas for my first cup of Earl Grey than you can do in a year in the field. Directed James. Oh, so why do you need me, Bond asks. Every now and then, a trigger has to be pulled, Q says, or not pulled. It's hard to know which. In your pajamas, Bond says. Bond, the consummate individualist, knows that you need knowledge of the time and circumstances on the ground in order to make a good decision. For both Bond and Hayek, central planning didn't work because you couldn't get accurate and timely information if you're not actually in the field. So Hayek argued that centralized coordination of large-scale economic activity wasn't practical 70 years ago. What was needed instead was a mechanism or decentralization that could effectively aggregate and react to all of the local knowledge that each individual in the economy possessed. Hayek's solution was the price system, which he described as a kind of machinery for registering change. This machine enables individual producers, yep, his words, not mine, individual producers to watch merely the movement of a few pointers in order to understand what is happening in the economy at large. In essence, Hayek suggested that the price system was a primitive calculator of information and that prices were a metric or key performance indicators that producers could use to understand economic activity. Very interesting, right? So saying, you know, um, central planning, the whole idea of kind of socialism, uh, you know, communism, uh, centrally coordinated government would break down because you couldn't have all this information, right? You couldn't have all the information, you can process all the information, it's all this local information, you just, there's no way to bring it all together. Later on in that chapter, we've got a little, uh, uh, you know, sub, subsection called Lenin Loves Google. Actually, you could probably replace this with She Loves Google. Uh, the connected revolution has blown apart the key assumptions underlying Bruce Henderson's concept economies of scale and micro portage value chain. Um, taken together, they have invalidated Hayek's assertion that a central planner can't organize large-scale uh, economic activity, right? In this case, the, the central planner being the government. Today, that's precisely what's happening to increasingly large sections of our economy. The only difference is that the central planner is not a government bureaucrat. Rather, it's a set of algorithms and software tools operated by a platform business in order to manage and grow a decentralized network. Interesting, right? See how these things go hand in hand? The platform business model 
is the central planner's dream. And so literally in, in China uh, or other communist totalitarian regimes, when you give a tech monopoly, you know, and, and you give that, those, the keys to the kingdom to the tech monopoly to the central planner government bureaucrat, kind of problematic. We see these platform monopolies exerting more and more control over society, um, you know, it, whether in uh, U.S. or Western markets or, uh, you know, um, China or other, uh, you know, communist regimes to different levels of, you know, government participation. But what we're seeing is that in either situation, whether it's in the U.S. or in China or elsewhere, that, that these power sources are abusing their power. And they are using that power to uh, influence their will and silence um, opinion and to um, change uh, and influence how we think. You know, we talked a little bit with General Spaulding about the 50 Cent Party. Uh, we've talked a lot about on the show about that. Um, that's uh, Chinese individuals working on external social networks to change your opinion um, on certain topics, or now a myriad of topics, actually. So we're in an information war. You know, we, we everyone, is, is, uh, is under siege of trying to figure out what to think. Um, and you have now uh, big government and big tech trying to, in some cases, influence, in some cases, in other cases, just uh, write out control, you know, what you're allowed to think um, or what you're allowed to consume in terms of content, right? So go back to 1984. Now he's talking about, you know, this is now the, the central character in the book. And he's, he's talking about the past always changing. And that the, the, uh, the, the government in the book <laughs> keeps on changing um, all the, uh, in the newspapers and the textbooks. And, and the, literally, history is malleable. Nothing stays the same. Is the past not only changed, but changed continuously. But most afflicted him, him with the sense of nightmare is that he had never clearly understood why the huge imposture was undertaken. The immediate advantages of falsifying the past were obvious, but the ultimate motive was mysterious. He took up his pen again and wrote, I understand how, do not understand why. And he, he wondered, as he had many times wondered before whether he himself was a lunatic because you know he says god I, i'm pretty sure this thing happened but then literally everything keeps changing you never feel like you're actually on equal footing you know you interpreted something as happening one way but then you look it up um you know uh in 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 the news uh or in the textbooks or or social media or youtube or wikipedia and it and it just changes, right? So you say, am I crazy? Perhaps a lunatic was simply a minority of one. At one time, it had been a sign of madness to believe that the earth goes around the sun today, uh, to believe that the past is unalterable. Unalterable, right? Uh, he might be alone in holding that belief, and if alone, then a lunatic. This idea that... Um, Big tech, big government are not only changing and influencing how you think, what the past is, but also making you think that you're alone, right? That, that you're out on an island. No one else thinks like you. Maybe you're crazy. Let me see if I can pull this clip up. Once the tower's down, the fleet will be stuck in Atmo for just minutes, with no shields and no way out. We think hitting the cannons might ignite the main reactors. That's our chance. We need to pull some holdo maneuvers, do some real damage. Come on, that move is one in a million. 
fighters and freighters can take out their cannons if there are enough of us. He's right. We'd be no more than bugs to them. That's where Lando and Chewie come in. They'll take the Falcon to the core systems. Send out a call for help for anybody listening. We've got friends out there. They'll come if they know there's hope. They will. First Order wins by making us think we're alone. We're not alone. Good people will fight if we lead them. There it is. The First Order wins by making us feel we're alone. You got Winston, the main character in 1984, saying, Am I crazy? Am I all alone? Everything that I thought was true, everyone's telling me is not true and is not actually the case. I don't think I'm crazy. I don't think I'm wrong, but am I alone? Big tech, big government, silencing people's voices, trying to influence what they think, what is true, what happened in the past, trying to make you feel alone. Not alone. They try to divide us. You see everything now with, uh, you know, with, with, we've, we've had uh, Tim Kendall on the show talking about social media's algorithms, um, you know, trying to basically just enrage us, turn us against each other, uh, make everything, you know, seem so black and white um, and, you know, put us in these echo chambers, right? It's juicing their engagement. They see the outcomes that are happening to just kind of divide society and turn us against each other um, and then try to uh, make us feel and then, you know, silencing opinions that uh, don't fit the narrative, right? And well, this has been happening for years. This isn't just a political thing. We've seen, we've had uh, Peter Saddington on the show, big crypto guy who um, like two years ago had his channels with hundreds of thousands of subscribers, just boom, puff, gone. Um, nothing to do with politics, just cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency, you know, was now deemed a, uh, you know, a topic that YouTube didn't agree with. And, and all, not only to mention all, all of his subscribers were gone, all of his videos are gone too. He didn't have, you know, he just was putting them on YouTube. So all that content gone is no recourse against the big tech monopoly that is Google and YouTube. So it's true. We're all part of this resistance. We all see what's going on. We may not be able to, uh, <laughs> you know, leave our families and leave our jobs and go fight with, uh, you know, in this instance, Lando and Finn and, and, uh, you know, be fight, you know, flying X wings and stuff and really going full bore rebellion resistance level. But we can all see what's going on. There's actually a lot more of us than you would think. A lot of people are awake, if not waking up. And a lot of people are looking for ways that they can help push back against this big tech and big government overreach, which we, see now more than ever so we got a little star wars reference we got some 1984 references let's go back to 1984 we got modern monopolies references let's go back to 1984 the mutability of the past is the central tenant of ingsoc which is basically just the 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 new reference to like the new government uh in this in this book past events it is argued have no objective existence but survive only in written records and in human memories. The past is whatever the records and the memories agree upon. And since the party is in full control of all records and in equally full control of the minds of its members, it follows that the past is whatever the party chooses to make it. It also follows that though the past is alterable, it never has been altered in any specific instance. For when it has been recreated in whatever shape is needed at the moment, then this new version is the past and no different past can ever have existed, right? Just makes your head explode with uh, just uh, <laughs> so many conflicts, but you got to think that way or else you fall out of line. This holds good even when, as often happens, the same event has to be altered out of recognition several times in the course of a year. At all times, the party is in possession of absolute truth. And clearly, the absolute can never have been different from what it is now. It will be seen that the control of the past depends above all on, on the training of memory. 
To make sure that all written records agree with the orthodoxy of the, of the moment is merely a mechanical act. But it is also necessary to remember that events happened in the desired manner. So it's saying that if, if you, the individual, don't comply and just recognize and, not, and, and you have to block out that you know that the government or big tech is altering the past, but you have to take whatever big tech or the government says is true as true and you cannot recognize or infer or, or, or um, uh, you know, uh, acknowledge that big tech or the government is changing the past. You must take it for what it is worth and say that, yes, they are correct or else. In old speak, it is called, quite frankly, reality control. <laughs> In new speak, it is called doublethink. Though doublethink comprises much else as well. Doublethink means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. It's literally, I mean, <laughs> it, this is what drives you crazy, right? Two things contradicting themselves, but you say, yeah, you know, they're both true. You just, you need to relinquish any sense of logic to survive. And doublethink is summed up in, you know, something that I reference a lot on the show, which is, uh, you know, a common theme throughout the book, two plus two equals five, right? And we are just struck with so many instances in this book where you just have these inher inherently conflicting and contradictory uh, statements or, or, you know, truths which you're forced to think is a truth in the book two plus two equals five is the constant thing and you know you have winston here the character saying freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two makes four so you see a couple things here right you see big tech big government using platform power to monitor you control your actions control what you think change the past make you feel that you are alone. And when we say that people are waking up to this, people are kind of seeing what's going on. I think it's just recognizing that that is actually what big tech and big government are uh, doing, right? Trying to control us in these ways, trying to control us, trying to control uh, what's true and, and what's allowed to be considered true. Um, and there just are so many inherent conflicts and contradictory um, aspects of our society today. And it makes you feel loopy, right? It makes you feel like you kind of live in upside down world, right? Like it doesn't make sense what's going on. And then you think to yourself, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Like, am I alone in thinking this? Am I the only one that thinks going on doesn't make sense? <clears throat> and that's the whole idea. As we've seen in the book, 1984, as we've seen in now Star Wars, episode nine, <clears throat> they want you to feel alone, but you're not alone. That was General Spaulding's message, right? That there's actually a lot of people waking up to what's going on, whether it's China, whether it's big tech control. A lot of people are waking up, are awake, and are looking to take action. They may not be the rebels in the army. And their X-wings going and fighting the first order and the first wave. But they may come in that, in that second wave. And let me go, just go for a second to, uh, you know, to round out on this whole thing with uh, Facebook and Trump. When platforms become uh, too big, who do they start to take, care, take advantage of? It's the producers, in this case, content creators. They try to silence content creators. They try to um, regulate the message, what you're allowed to say. And, you know, they want to push their agenda. <clears throat> I think this is actually a big mistake specifically to, uh, to take this approach. Um, don't think it, it ends up working well for anyone. And I have faith that people will act and not stand for the oppression and the, uh, the continued uh, abuses that these tech monopolies, which Twitter is also, they're just not a monopoly, but they're clearly a perpetrator of this, if not the worst perpetrator. 
of not living by the the platform ethos. This is a a big mistake for Facebook. I don't know. I think again, uh, I had Jeremy Kaufman, the founder of uh, Library, which has um, a, a a blockchain alternative for YouTube, effectively, and then they have Odyssey Top Five Thousand website, which is a which is using uh, the library blockchain um, and is a content platform for you know. Uh, user-generated content videos like YouTube. Top 5,000 website. They're doing very, very well. And he was asking me why I think, you know, they've become, they being the big tech monopolies, have become so aggressive in content censorship. And, you know, what I was saying is I don't think that Zuckerberg actually has control of the company anymore. I think there are so many people uh, that are radicalized inside of these companies that have an agenda against whatever it is, crypto, religion, uh, you know, political ideologies. And it is now too big for Zuckerberg to even control. And so really what this oversight board did is they just kicked it back to Facebook. And, and they said here, the group criticized Facebook for seeking to avoid its responsibilities by giving Mr. Trump the indeterminate and standardless penalty of indefinite suspen- suspension. They punted it back to Facebook and said, you need to make a final verdict in the next six months. Kind of saying you can either reinstate him, suspend him for a finite period, or bar him permanently. Kind of seems like they have barred him permanently, so maybe this is more of just a nuanced thing. They clearly don't want to be the target of all the wrath that has now come down uh, on President Trump. And that's why I'll close out here with Rules for Radicals. This is a scary book. You read this book, man, you'll see a lot of things happening. That, yikes. Um, so literally, the book gives like 13 or 14 rules for radicals. Uh, and one of them is the 13th rule. Pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. In conflict tactics, there are certain rules that the organizer should always recognize as universalities. One is that opposition must be singled out as the target, frozen. Uh, By this, I mean that in a complex, interrelated, urban society, it becomes increasingly difficult to single out who is to blame for any particular evil. There is a constant and somewhat legitimate passing of the buck. In these times of urbanization, complex metropolitan governments, the complexities of major interlock corporations and interlocking political life, in cities and countries, da, da, da. the problem that threatens to loom more and more is that of identifying the enemy. Obviously, there's no point to tactics unless one has a target upon which to center the attacks. One big problem is a constant shifting of responsibility from one jurisdiction to another. Individuals and bureaus, one after another, disclaim responsibility for particular conditions. In a corporation, one gets a situation where the president of the corporation says that he does not have the responsibility. When the mayor is attacked, he shifts the responsibility over to the committee. When you freeze the target, you you disregard these arguments and for the moment, all the others to blame. Then as you zero in and freeze your target and carry out your attack, all of the others come out of the woodwork very soon. They become visible by their support of the target. The other important point in choosing, in the choosing of a target, is that it must be a personification, not something general and abstract, such as a community's segregated practices or a major major corporation or city hall. It's not possible to develop the necessary hostility against a city hall. With this focus comes a polarization. As we have indicated before, all issues must be polarized if action is to follow. One acts decisively only in the conviction that all the angels are on one side and all the devils on the other. What Rules for Radicals is saying, that Rule 13, saying it it needs to be polarizing. Social media platforms, God, they're the epitome of of polarizing things, uh, turning us against each other, not finding common ground, making it this way or that way. You're either all dumb or all right, or these people are crazy, you know, kind of. So rules for radicals, big tech monopolies, big government trying to power grab. I mean, all these things are coming together. It's like on one side, (laughs) I mean, 
you know, tech monopolies are like the perfect mechanism to bring about all these different components of how you grab power and control society, right? I mean, wow. Is it's all going to accelerate here, um, this great awakening. And that's how I, I've kind of come at it and, and remained optimistic, right? Is that, you know what? When you read through the book 1984, key thing in 1984 is that you know, basically everyone's uneducated and, and that's a huge way for, for, the, for the government in Ingsoc uh, in the book to control people. And so just extremely uneducated and very malleable. So, you know, they can do double think and not get too disturbed over it. Americans are smart. People throughout the globe are smart. They can pick up on this stuff. They may not have all gone to college. They may not have studied economics. They may not you know, um, <clears throat> read a bunch of books on tech and politics and all these kinds of things, but people inherently can pick up on what is right and what is wrong. And <clears throat> banning the former president is wrong. It goes fundamentally against free speech, it goes fundamentally against the whole uh, purpose of platform business models. It plays directly into doublethink where there are a myriad of contradictory actions of hypocrisy in the system of unjust, um, uh, of biased application of rules. And people can see that they don't need to be the smart, you know, the, they don't need to be the most educated or, uh, you, you know, people that you would, um, you know, put in these elitist kind of groups and stuff, but people are smart and they can figure this stuff out. And so this stuff only helps to accelerate that great awakening. This stuff only helps to compound people's frustration with big tech and big government. And I think that's how General Spaulding came at it at the end of the interview, remaining positive that, hey, even if China, he thinks they are going to take Taiwan in the next, I think, three Three years, or he might have said three to five, but definitely in the next five years, said China's taken Taiwan. And he said, you know, and then it's really going to burst the bubble and the narrative around China. People are going to wake up around China, and you know, hopefully get smart to what China is doing, and that they can't be trusted. I don't know if it will be the Taiwan event because again, you do have big tech <laughs> that is controlling what people think, that is changing the past, um, and that's a very powerful force. But I do think it is a, all a step in the direction of us, the collective resistance, from leveling the playing field against big tech, big government, whether that's incumbent enterprises, individuals, American citizens, individuals around the world. We're all in this together and we will overcome the tech tyranny and big government oppression and silencing of what we're allowed to think and say. Eventually, it will change. Probably needs to get a little bit worse than it is today before it does change, but eventually it will change. That's it for us today in Winner Take All. Thank you very much for joining. I will talk to you soon.